Where is it this year? Yeah, uh, not this year, no. No, no okay. Before, yeah, no, no. okay. And how about the other gentleman there? How'd you go, guys? Oh, yeah, I'll tell you. Just small stuff. On small stuff as well. On Stratty Beach, mate? Or yeah. inside? Oh, Main Beach. Main Beach, okay. Yeah. I mean, I saw this, like, a post the other on some thing. Do it down at Burley Heads. Like, yeah. Like, some monsters on yeah. the beach. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I've seen doors and I'm not doing <laughs> Well, we'll try and eliminate yeah. that tonight, okay? <laughs> um, so it's a lot about presenting your bait and and many, many things, which I'll try and help you out on. Just, um, we're going to talk about bait collecting too. So, uh, how many people here have a yabby pump or use dig for yabbies? Okay, you'll do that. If you don't, I'd suggest you get one because they're quite expensive to buy. I think, I think they're around 40 for 10 bucks now, or, or 25 for 10 bucks. It's well, something like that's up there, right? So 40 cents a yabby or something. If you can't dig yourself 100 yabbies in about 20 minutes, there's something wrong with you. So. There's the qualities you get, and 100 yabbies is 200 bucks worth, you know. So, oh, not 200 dollars, it's uh, 25 dollars, whatever it is. It's expensive, yeah. So, um, no, more than 40 dollars, sorry, <laughs> do the equation. But um, anyhow, it doesn't take a lot to pay off an 80 dollar yabby pump, so I'm getting it. Okay. Um, the second thing is, how many people here can catch beach worms? Only a couple of you. <laughs> <laughs> I could give you two actually. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so catching beach worms is an art to that too, but tonight we'll we'll run you through. We do have a thing on YouTube on catching beach worms. I suggest you watch it over and over and over and over. Um there is an art to it, but once you get your first couple of full worms, not heads, um it's if it just happens, it just comes to you, okay? It's like riding a bike, I guess. You just know how it works. Um and then who's dug mud worms here before? Okay, a couple of you have. Okay, um, we'll talk about that as well, but um, it's getting hard to get the mud worms because a lot of places used to get it, they can't go there anymore because it's classed as an environmental you know, green zone. So um, there are limited areas you can get mud worms, but they are the best bait for, by far for any whiting fishing. Um, but uh, we'll talk about that a bit later as well. So that's the three baits we're going to cover. And then um, um, those of you who have boats, who has a boat that's over five metres that can't get in the shallow grounds? Yeah, that's Zane and yours. Okay, time to look down at a tin, yeah? <laughs> no, that's okay, it's fine. You can still, I just fish over 680 hangs all the time for a while, but you just limit to where you can get into yeah, sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but, but that's okay, so just a little boat, you can actually get up in those creeks, and a lot of those creeks open up into bigger and deeper, and that's where the whiting are sometimes. <clears throat> but you just got to um, see how you go. Okay. Where were you sitting last weekend or the... So, sorry, Where were you sitting last weekend or the... Um, Gold Coast? Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, we were fished up around Paradise Point. Yeah. yeah, actually, and I've been up the, in the last uh, three weeks, we've done Pimpama, Paradise Point, Pumba, and over the beachy, over on, on um, Spit, but between, there's a really good hole now, if anyone's seen it, at, uh, right in front of the car park at Phillip Car Park. There's really good whiting there. At, not all the time, but when the swell's been small, it's been really good. Does anyone see that hole there yet? It's the best hole I've seen. Like the tail that was just there a month ago. It's, it's fantastic. Um, but the whiting come in there is once the tide gets up about sort of halfway. It's very good. Yeah, and it's right at your feet. It's just like fishing a pond. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah, have a look at it. Right where Philip Car Park is, walk straight out of the beach there. Yeah. And you'll see it. Yeah. yeah fair enough. It comes in really close. It's like a red flag in front of it. Uh, they're always right next to it actually, <laughs> but no, so I think it's a bit dangerous because the rip goes straight out of it, so yeah. And the other is down around the sand pump and jetty. Is anyone fish for whiting down around the sand pump and jetty? Such a great spot. Um, I'll tell you about that today as well, okay. Uh, but anyway, we will start at the gear. So when I'm beach fishing uh, for whiting, I tend to use um, not, I used to use real long rods, so it's 10 foot 6, 11 foot 4, whatever. Um, but then I realised I'm not fishing for tar I'm dart, I'm fishing for whiting. So whiting are right at your feet. You don't need to cast very far. You, you don't need a long rod to, to get the distance, right? Um, and you're constantly in the white water. So it doesn't matter how long your rod is, it doesn't keep it up out of the white water because it's just, it's just white water, unless you've got no swell and shore break. So I tend to use a very short rod, uh, eight foot six or eight foot. So this is my, one of my beach fishing rods. And I, use, I, I used to use Elvis and I still do use Elvis, but I tend to use um, egg beaters, that's what I got my kids into years ago. Um, sorry, let's get this out of here. It's caught up. Sabotage. Don't say no on your pair of scissors. Okay, 
So this is all I use. It's just, it's not expensive and it like smashes the whiting. I mean, like unbelievably, okay? It's all about the length of the rod, the action in the rod. And I just use a 4,000 size reel. I don't know if it's a two and a half, but I generally use a 4,000. I've got about five of these type rods, all in a similar style. A um, couple of better ones. Um, but I just use um, eight pound braid and about 10 pound leader and a bit of a longer trace in the surf because I want my worm to sort of really flick around a little bit. Um, and I'm using about a four ball sinker or a three ball sinker. And the hooks I'm using are generally a size four or size three in a medium bait holder. Um, what is a bait holder in the surf? Because you give it a little bit of a flick and, you, and when you're in the boat, you're just popping it out there. But in the surf, you're oomphing it out because you've got a bit of wind blowing against you. And you need to hold that bait up on the hook. That's the most important part, which you want going wrong down the back there, maybe. You've got to have the worm up above the thigh of the hook. Yeah, I, 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 I don't want to go on. Okay. Not we'll keep, we'll keep, we'll pick. Maybe in the hooks, there's the difference there. Too. Yeah. 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 So I, I, I can get bait out there and it's instantly get an attack. Yeah. But I'm trying to no, get okay. fish on it sort of thing. Okay. So, yeah, size four. Mm -hmm. um, and I use braid because I can feel a lot better in the surf and I do use mono when I'm fishing in the estuary all the time, but in the surf I only use braid. Uh, you get a little line twist. And there's a lot of characteristics that really make it really good. Um, but casting and sweep through the water is the most number one important thing for braid. And then feels probably the next one. Yeah, so um, that's my rig. So eight foot six or eight foot, whatever it is. Light tip, um, two piece rod, I can easily throw it in the car. And when we go out north, I go up to Tiwa or wherever the kids for the weekend, um, we just throw all the rods in the boot and they're already right, right, rigged to go, you know? And, uh, and we always smack the whiting or the dart, whatever, on them. Um, so, but I do have heaps of 10 foot, 6 and 11 foot, 4 rods. Old school style, 6 inch alvey, still work very well too. But you don't need to get the distance because most of the time you're casting within about, well, maybe, uh, 30 metres or 20 metres, that's it. And the further out you go, you don't get any wadding, you get dark and you get brim and stuff like that, but you won't get the wadding, they're right there at your feet. And sometimes you'll be wanting your line in and not get a bite, and the next minute, like, da -da -da, right, right there, and they're just there. And you catch a good wadding, you know, so I think, okay, next time cast, I'll just pop it that way with the current, really close, and straight away, straight away get bites, as you're saying, mate, you know? So, um, that's what I use, yeah. Really important when you're surf fishing um, to cast quite a bit of the current's going, it's going the faster it's going, the more up you go in the angle. Really, really important. As soon as it hits the water, quickly take the, the loose line up, even if there's a big wave about to break in front of you. Hold the rod up as you're stepping back, don't trip over, wind up high. Um, I use cheap reels because most especially my kids, you know, they put the reel in the water and under the tip of the rod. You know, this if you if you get a three or four hundred dollar reel, hey, nice to use, but Longevity is pretty the same as a $60 reel. So um, I tend to use just like a Sienna or a, uh, any Shimano, sort of little cheap one, Sedona or whatever, you know, they seem to work all right. You only catch them whining. Okay, nice eating that. Okay, so that's my gear. Um, my sinker size and hook size, I try and stick in size four. Sinkers depends on the day. So if, there's, if it's beautiful and calm, there's not much uh, wind and not much sweep. Um, I'll try and get down to probably a size two, which is um, fairly small, like that sort of size, it's two ball. I like the ball sinkers because I like my line to move for whiting and that, like it's just throwing it there, the flat one to sit there, doesn't seem to work as good. So use ball sinkers, don't use beam, use ball, okay? Um, and just constantly keep that line winding in. And when you feel that bite, right? When you feel the bite, like dun 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 dun, dun yeah. just wind faster and Try and hook yeah, it. Right. Yeah, you gotta keep it coming, keep it coming. Yeah, because I was thinking, oh no, he's there. Waiting for it to take it? No, no. There, no, you gotta keep it going, keep it going. So imagine if there's a worm, I don't know what stupid worm come out of his hole in the sand, but <laughs> if you had a worm <laughs> floating on the, on the bottom, he, and then he thinks chasing, he's gonna keep going really fast. Sure. And that's how their aggressive attack's gonna be. Yeah, right. Just try and think how they're gonna feed. Um, but I don't think the worm just sit there and let him crack at it. Yeah, right. I wouldn't think so. so um, keep that rod tip up, keep it whining, keep it whining. Just when they do that bit, bit, bit more of an aggressive dunk is when you pull on them. Well, they, they, they like to like swallow it whole, grab the whole A lot of time they do swallow, but that, that sort of feeling, when you feel those little whiting, especially in boat fishing, you feel that, like a ding, 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 yeah. ding, ding, that's them pushing it down their throat. Yeah, right. And those ones you got pretty well hooked. 
but when they're dum 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 biting it, yeah. um, that's then pecking, 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 pecking. Yeah, right. But then I get aggressive and try and grab it. That's when you got to hook it. But with whiting, they're pretty pretty darty, as you know, the yeah. the head down, yeah. and you've got to always keep the weight on. If you drop the the weight any time any time, the hook can fall out. So yeah. keep keep it going. Keep your hooks really sharp too. Most of those hooks you've got in your bags are Japanese steel. They're really sharp. So they're really good quality ones, okay? Um, so let's say you've got your fish on the beach. How often do you change your hook a few times? No, not at all. Not at all. Not, if it's not working for me, or I try not to get the wrong hook oh, no, from the start. Like oh, okay, yeah, good, good call. Um, I never find they get blunt, but they do bend. If you get a lot of them down the throat. Um, I want to bring a whitey along tonight, but I didn't bring one along, but to show you how to pop it out. But I've got a video here later I'll show you, and I'll draw it up a bit later as well. But when you do that, you tend to bend the hooks, especially barb ones. Because when you take a barb out, it weakens the hook, it's that little nick out, and quite often it'll bend on that point, or even snap on some hooks. You might have found that. So, um, but I just straighten it back up. But when it's a little bit bent, especially if I'm using a, a like a true turn hook like this style, yeah. they're good hooks, but they, they're just terribly weak. So after about two fish or three fish, you cut off and tie it on again. So you think, well, I don't have got time to do that, especially from the beach, you've got to walk back up the top, cut it off the top. Sometimes that bite period might be half an hour, so you don't have the time. Yeah. So get a good hook from the start, yeah, the right hook. Um, swivels, um, yeah, keep the swivels small. I see so many people bring their lines in here and they've got 10 pound braid and 10 pound leader and a size one swivel, which isn't as big as a sinker, but it weighs more than a sinker. Swivels are as big. You don't want big swivels, you want little tiny swivels that are um, petite and the fish don't see it. It still does the job right, don't use the rolling, uh, the old uh, brass barrel swivels and stuff like that, they don't turn very well. Use a crane swivel, which is what you got in your bag there. I'll sort of give you a bit of everything so you can try, if you're not using it, you'll soon realise you should be using it, okay? Um, but that's what I use there. Um, in hooks, getting back to what Sam, but hooks, um, in, who's from Victoria? Sorry, no offence, but it's fine. Um, it's all right. Oh, sorry, was, he was, okay, mate. Down south, they tend to use a lot of two hook rigs and surf for whiting, that's what I'm getting at. Um, very popular. And um, in, up here we don't, we use a running sinker. I have been on the beach a lot of times and seen, especially a lot of Asian people, and they, they tend to run a small star sinker, like this fish for whiting, size one star or size two, which is only very small, at the bottom like a paternoster. And they use a rig like this type of thing here, which I think you've got one in your bags as well. Give it a shot. So the two hook rig, you run two lots of wide and the two yabbies. Um, you just got to put the sinker on the bottom, swivel goes to the top, and um, and you just throw it out. But it does anchor it, so it goes against my ethics on whiting fishing. But I see them catch lots of whiting, so I think. <laughs> <laughs> but and I see them pull up in two at a time, like you know, 25, 30 centimeter ones. So I'm a bit annoyed about that. So um, I'm going to try it. I haven't tried it yet, but I know it works because that's the rig they're using. So give it a shot. I'm going to try it, so give it a go. Um, probably that's about it for beach fishing. Don't use the bells on the beach. Um, how to do it. So you need to know how to read the water. That's really important on mining fishing and on, on any type of fishing in every instance that, you, that, you, that you're doing, whatever fishing it might be. So you need to know, okay, um, it's just all breaking waves there and it's white water rolling in, rolling in, rolling in. There's no depth to it. and is there any reason why they'd be whiting feeding there? Probably not, okay? But if you've got a white water coming in and a shore break that's dumping and it's quite deep straight behind, there's no white water behind, it's just deep. There's a good reason why whiting be there, especially if the beach comes in. Yeah, you get beaches have points where you worm on and then it comes in close and then it goes back out again. Well, where it comes in close, especially if the sweep's going that way, the water's gonna be coming, the sand and stuff's gonna be coming up that edge and dropping into that little gutter. That's sort of facing back in towards you, which I'll show you here. Does everyone understand what I'm talking about? Yeah, right. Still. No, no idea. Okay. <laughs> Oops. I need those mats for later, so I can't them out. So, If this is the surf, the shoreline here, and you've got waves breaking on the there, and it might come in a little bit like that, and then it sort of goes back out, a little point like that, and then it comes in. That's how the surf normally is. And we call these worming banks, because they've got a longer 
amount of white water to run off, you've got more chance of pulling the worm out for the next white water comes in. The steep ones here where the white water's constantly there, they're there all the time. Um, but sometimes the whiting are there because it's enclosed. But it's not necessarily, it's not good for, for worming, that's for sure, because they're too steep. But what happens is if your sweep's going this way, the water current's going that way, you'll get a bit of crap come off the sand just right there. Okay? So what I do is I stand right about here. So this is, I'm talking about out here is probably like maybe, I don't know, waist deep or knee deep. And this is the edge of the shoreline, so here. So you get it what I'm talking about? So that drains out, maybe it's not quite that far, but it is something. But under the water looks like this. So I'll stand about here. There's still the water, probably shin deep, and I'll cast up to there, or maybe even up to there. And my line will come across here, but they should all be sitting here, feeding on that edge of the water coming along. Um, and then they may be feeding on this bank here, it's quite deep. And when you get quite a steep bank, you get a lot of stuff comes off the bank quite quick. Where here it's just all rumble and white water and it's really hard to fish. So you stand here and you cast up there again, or up that way. And when once you cast, are you is it a constant? Constant, mate. As soon as I hit the waters, because you gotta get dark and other stuff trying to beat the whiting. Mm -hmm. it, it won't actually hit the whiting until it hits the bottom, they won't be mid-water, they're generally feeding right down the bottom. Yeah. So um, I'll try and wind a little bit, uh, throw out, try to make rod tip up, wind a couple of turns. Feeding it down to the bottom sort of thing if I can, but to get away from the dart. Otherwise if I cast it out and I take up the slack and I'm sort of worried about stepping back to the, the waves because I've walked out and cast out when the tide goes, when the water drains out to get a little bit further, maybe just over the edge, up there if I want to. Um, and the dart will get it if, if you don't um, take it away from them. But in this instance here, it, it's the, we get a little dart, will be on the front here, but most of the big ones will be at the back here, or at the back here. So here's going to be like a whiting spot, a bit less, um, less com uh, competition for the whiting and better for you. And they'll be all the way along this edge here, feeding. Um, that particular spot I was telling you about at the, um, uh, on the beach at um, Phillip Park there at the moment. So that's the sand dunes up here. It actually comes in like, like that at the moment. Very aggressive. The bit, it's only one on the whole beach there as I can see. And um, the whiting are just there all the way. As I was saying, that's one is the scenario, that's how it is. At the moment, they're all, all three here. It's on the spit at Phillip Park, which is opposite SeaWorld, where the renegade is at SeaWorld, the yeah. car park there. Yeah. Just walk straight to the beach and it's right there in front of you. But like that, that layout, the coastline, everywhere you walk, but you know, mm. from Broadway to surfs, you'll find those little... You do find those divots like, about every... Uh, not those aggressive as that one, no, though. That's very... But every, you know, oh yeah, meters, that's about right. Yep. And that's yeah, and that's right. So this type of stuff here doesn't hold any whiting, but yeah. that that stuff does. Yeah. So that's what you got to look for. It's only only time this will hold whiting if you got a little swell, and you can walk out because the waves won't be rolling up as much. So if you're probably rolling up to about here instead of up to here, say so when the tide.
Yeah, yeah. So the fishing's really good. We do a lot of fishing of the Tiwa, um, particularly um, around that sort of. Um, yeah, I forget the name of it. It's, it's where Noosa National Park finishes and you can start camping. So from there up is really good fishing for whiting. Further south it looks really good for whiting, but we never hardly caught any whiting there. So that's a really good area. Fraser, obviously, um, you get whiting more at the southern end of, of Fraser or right at the top. You don't get much where you get the tail and they get eaten, so they don't want to move it. They stay away from the tail or whatever else. Um, and down south, further well, it's hardly even south, so I'll talk about that today. But um, yeah, just, just gotta try and find the find that sort of scenario on the beach and you catch whiting in most places. Sorry. But the, Sorry, yeah, but we are, I think. I don't know what wife's doing then, but hey. <laughs> I think it is. You can watch it later. Oh, okay. Yeah, 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 definitely, mate. Um, just another thing too, I want to talk about the, the pump and jigger. Out of all the whiting spots on the beach here, the pump and jigger area is my favourite, okay? For some reason, it holds bigger whiting, um, and that's what I like to catch. And um, I'll just quickly draw that up. Just, if you're going to give it a go, that's where I would go more than that spot. I only like that spot there because I was worming. I thought, geez, that was going to bring my rods down, so the quick fish there, and there's whiting there, of course. But um, the pump and jetty is my go to spot. So let's just imagine this is the pump and jetty. Over there, that's the sand dunes up here. And this is, say, the shoreline here. And the shoreline always comes in here and goes back out like that. And it actually goes like that. And then it comes in like that. That changes all the time like that in town. Um, and, and that's the rock wall sort of there. Okay, and that's the pump and jetty. So um, there's two places you can fish here, the pump and jetty. I always start on this side, which is the southern side. And I always, and this is um, say, the edge of the water line and the top when the waves come in is probably roughly about here, okay? Does that make sense? So yeah. that's all white water or sometimes sand exposed, white water comes back up again. Um, so what I'll do, I'll do normally, as long as the, top, the um, as long as the waves aren't too big, um, I'll walk out to around this area here and I'll up to about my, just over my knees and I tend to cast again the current's going this way and when it gets here it goes quite powerful. Has anyone fished that area before? You catch white in there? Sure. Uh, one or two, yeah. One or two, yeah. Not consistent. Okay, mate. Um, this time of year is very good. Uh, this time of year right through to about May. Okay. So we're just starting here. Um, so you're fishing here and you're casting out in this direction here and it comes in very quickly and you've got the poles that sort of sit like this under the, they come out like that on an angle like that underneath it. So you've got to watch out, you're going to get caught in the poles but you'll get a lot in this whole area here. A lot of white in that area, you get them out here too, I've caught lots out here too. Um, the back break is out here somewhere, okay, this is like gutter. And that's a really good area, that whole area there. When they go up to bite a bit there, they move over to this side and they tend to sit very close to the, to the edge right here. And uh, when I'm there, I'm just sitting here and I cast up under the jetty between the poles and it comes through very quick and constantly hold my rod tip up and just winding very slowly. Okay, and they'll come through. I mean, Jack's done a lot of fish with heaps of water in the jacket. Mm, yeah, and has, yeah. he's seen this in the waves, like yeah. whole yeah. schools of them. In, assuming in, in that dump on the shore break here, they're right there. Like, I see guys sent, they're casting out here somewhere, you know? No good. Very close. And from here to the back of the room. Where do they come from? Where does the school of Whiting come from? <sighs> Which I knew. From the estuary? Yeah, from Mrs. Whiting. <laughs> okay, they, they do come from the estuary, I think, and go out. They're not offshore Whiting, that's for sure. Um, and then um, they tend to be out there like a lot through winter, like now and then they come back in again. If you get a big flush around uh, February from the rain, <coughs> they all go outside and they hang out there to about May. So I think their time out there is always around now on the beach. And then um, and we start to get them in the estuary, start to come in the estuary. I don't know what they go out there for, clean up, I don't know. Then they come back into the estuary and, um, and it's not until we get a lot of rain that they go back out again. And sometimes they stay there the whole winter, but you don't catch many. For some reason. No. 
But that's where I began, number one. You catch beach worms just here on the beach as well, because that's a good beach worming area. But the best beach worms at the moment, they're, they're bloody huge on the beach at the moment. Has anyone been worming recently? They've always been big, big. Yeah, they're huge, yeah. They've always been big on that beach. Yeah, yeah, they are like that. They're too Someone hands. pulls back in. <laughs> they do get two hands and get them out. So they're really good at the moment around, um, uh, we've been getting them at the car park at Mirage and just walking on the beach and walking down a bit sort of behind Mirage Resort and that's just past the, um, the, the lifeguard there and just on the beach there there's plenty and they're real fat and there's heaps and, and halfway in tide's better than bottom tide. Bottom tide they're there but they're really hard to get them. Yeah. 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 So um, that's about it for the beach fishing. I'll stop there on the beach fishing. Okay, um, we'll go now to estuary fishing um, and actually, no, I'll do shoreline. So if you're fishing the shoreline, so many guys don't have boats, so if you're fishing the shoreline, my favourite, I'll show you the map in a moment, but my favourite areas by far is the foreshore at Labrador right through to about property Paradise Point. And I'm talking all the, all the foreshore between all the canal systems, does that make sense? Along those fronts. Um, tide wise, uh, if you can get that early morning high tide or, or evening high tide, you get up there at night time, guys. Some of people fish at night time, but you do. But it needs to be that sort of high last hour of the run in, first hour of the run out. They're right up on the shore and they're right in really close. And you're fishing really small sinkers, like about a zero ball or a one ball, which is about the size of a pea or smaller. And you're fishing only out around maybe 10 metres from the shoreline, if that. Using little rods like this, so you can use that type of rod. Um, and sometimes we use, when we're fishing the sh foreshore, we use no sinker. We just use a, a yabby. Yabby's a really good bait on the foreshore, better than worms, I think. Um, so worms, you tend to get a lot of toadies and stuff like that, annoying the crap out of it. But you don't get as many of that. You still get them, but you don't get as many on, on yabbies. Um, does anyone here get yabbies without a boat? Does anyone not, not get yabbies without a boat? Want to yeah, know where to get them? Get them everywhere. Yeah. Like the Southport Bridge all out to Paradise Point. Correct, yeah, yeah that's you right. Walk and you see the hole and they're, Correct. They're, they're everywhere. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So get down there, um, and again on the foreshores, at halfway at tides better than low tide most of the time. You find that as well? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, um, like there, like yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so it's a bit muddy, but you can certainly. Yeah, but the best, the best yabby is actually in muddy sand, not sand sand. For some reason. Um, but yeah, so with the, go back to this map here now. Okay. Uh, not this map, it's on here. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, she was cranked up, Jack. Sorry. And Doug, do you find you catch bigger whiting with bigger yabbies? No, that's a really good question too. It depends on where you are. So I generally like um, smaller yabbies or medium size. I don't like big yabbies. Yeah. Don't want it for brim and dart, but not for whiting at all, ever. So you yeah. wouldn't crop yabbies, say, say wave break, yep. if you're going up to Pimpermar. Okay. To um, make sure that you've got bait yep. if you're going up there. Or say you're going to the pin. Yep. And you just want to make sure you get your bait. Uh, generally... Yeah, so generally the yabbies are similar size everywhere, but on the foreshores they tend to be smaller, yeah. um, not, not big ones. And in some places um, they're smaller size, not the little tiny ones, I mean like, you know, yeah. sort of medium size. Um, they're the perfect yabbies. Um, the big ones with the big claws on them, great yabbies, like for dart and brim and maybe flatties. But if I'm fishing up Pimpin, I'll be using beach worms or, or mud worms. More than yabbies, but the yabbies have their place, and that is um, gen definitely <coughs> on the foreshores that we're talking about. Back away break, great place for yabbies. And if you're going, say, into the rivers, Coomera, Pimpin, yep. uh, worms. Dirtier water, more worms. Worms, yep. Yeah, I sort of go, why not come up here and shit through what, but like if the yabbies are there, fish with them where they are. So yeah, the yeah. The fish will be looking for them. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's true, but there's not many beach worms up the river, <laughs> but they work well. Um, but there's not many mud worms either. They're, they're on the foreshore, mm -hmm. but out in the middle, although I have pulled up my anchor over the years sometimes and been mud on it, 
Unless there's a big fat mud worm sitting in the, in the mud with my anchor that's in 12 foot of water, 10 foot of water, I think, jeez, there's mud worms down there, you know? Not that I go down and dig them, but, <laughs> but, um, but as a bonus, I probably caught two whiting off that mud worm. But, um, but that's only happened very rarely. So I think you're right. I think um, match the hatch, they say, in a lot of places. But, but that's why I say back away break. And the foreshore, it is only the abbeys, and it works better. But the worms, you tend to get more up the river. Whether they identify beach worms like a cousin to the mudworm, maybe, they don't know. Maybe they've been out the ocean, they've caught eight, eaten the beach worms out there, and that's why they like them in the river. I don't know. I probably think the beach worms lost, but they remember what it is, I guess. Yeah. Do most whiting go out to the beach and understand beach worms and then go back in again? I don't think every whiting does, but I think a fair share must. Yeah. When you fish in that jetty, um, I fish it only in the day. So at night time, although I had, I, I lied, I had fished off the pump and jetty itself at night time and smashed the water. Really good, really good. So I always fish just behind the shore break, right behind it, as in the deeper side of it. And what the waves are breaking pretty well. Works really well. Yeah. But uh, with, uh, I have used the abbeys there, but definitely worms, the beach worms. I'm um, sorry, Jeff. Did you? Oh, it's cranking up. Is it a video? No, just no. It's on the um, mum's. It's just saved to screen top. Um, Whiting map. Oh, that's it. Yep, that one there first. I know that one. Ah, uh, so it's a lot. I was trying to get it away. <laughs> um, so this is. Can you all see it down the back? Yeah. Probably not as good, but you can. You can. Can you zoom in a little bit? Yeah, we're gonna zoom in. Uh, yes, uh, I'm talking all like the foreshore, so um, around this area here. Yeah, okay, good, thanks, good. Okay, so that's Sovereign Island Bridge just there, guys. Okay. So that's Sovereign Island Bridge um, just. Oh, I've, I've cut all the covered it with red ink, but <laughs> it's right there. Uh, so when I was a kid, my dad used to take his whiting fishing off the shoreline right on that corner there, which is down past that marina and complex there. I think you can still walk down to the end there, but I see there's some houses getting built down there now. Um, but that there on the run-in tides is such a great spot for still for big whiting. So if, if you're land based and don't have a boat, that's a great spot on the run-in tide, especially the first the run-in tide once it starts to cover this bit of bank that sometimes comes out on the corner here. Um, these little fishing platforms along here, um, I'd be fishing next to the fishing platform, not off the fishing platform, not for whiting anyhow. They're going to be right on the edge of the shoreline. Um, but you'll catch them all the way along here, particularly late afternoon, uh, early morning. Um, where Howard Street boat ramp is, which is around about here, so obviously Crab Island, that's run over boat marinas in there. So Howard Street boat ramps um, just before the marina. Um, it's a really good spot. Um, for whiting fishing in the dark, or just on dark. Okay, and all the way down along that whole foreshore to the, I think it's called Shearwater Estate entrance. There's a little rock wall on the south side of it. Um, but at night time, along that foreshore there, there's actually like a sort of stepped um, retaining wall on there. You can sit down and have a relax, watch your rods. I don't know, I can hold my rods the whole time fishing, but. <laughs> Some people can take the kids in there or something, they can have a bit of rest. Uh, but that's a really good area. And then the next area from Shearwater down to Rano Bay Canal that goes into the shopping centre, that whole foreshore is really good as well if you're land based. Okay. Um, I get a, I got a few elderly gentlemen that come in here that fish a lot along the front here from Bigger Waters Creek, uh, which is sorry here. Um, it's in. Baby Street. <laughs> Oh, that's, sorry, down further, mate. Yeah. Let's go down a little bit further. Sorry, that is how, that's a marina there. So this is the area here, Howard Street, sorry. That's where it's gas. okay. So that's Runner Bay Shopping Centre Canal there. Um, but down further, I should, there should be more, more than that. Like next boat, I mean, is it? I'm pretty sure. Just zoom out again, I zoom in, sorry. Oh, okay, you're right. That's on another map. Yeah. Um, just go to the next map. Oh, sorry, Paul. Oh, that's right. No, that's all right. I'll come back to it. Next one. Sorry. Let me... Let me one more. 
Oh, that's okay. That's it. Yeah, good. Thank you, mate. Um, so that's Bigger at Creek there. Um, so along here, I think it's Har Street or Taylor Street, right down to where those tuna are on the highway, the lights there. Um, that whole foreshore there is really good, but very early morning, guys. It'll be there like, at daylight. Doesn't matter what the tide is, the lighting is always there. And you can cast out far, you can get in close as well. Um, and when you get down, like, to the centre, I can't remember if it's past the tail street, but where that little car park is halfway along there, little car park, and um, it's right in front of that pretty well, actually. There's a beacon, the, the beacon's like touch distance down to the foreshore. That's the steep edge of it there. And that's the spot that you get a lot of good whining on that edge there. They come in right on the edge and feed, similar to an, on the surf, sort of fishing style. Uh, at um, at between uh, Bigger Creek and and um, and the lights at Labrador on and Brisbane Road, it's the waterfront along that. And there's a car park halfway along there, so between Bayview and Bigger, uh, Bayview and Labrador, sorry. Yeah, and there's one little car park that it's recessed in. And you can park there and walk over the to the water, and you see there's a beacon right next to you. It's a really steep drop off there. That's a really good area. The rest of it's quite quite flat. Come down towards Chara Seafood, which is down here, um, on that edge there, um, just before Charas, the bank goes out quite a long way, and that's really good at high tide if you can get that early morning late afternoon as well. Okay, you can fish really small sinkers there, cast it up current. The current there most of the time tends to, um, until you get close to the boat ramp, it always seems to run north. Have you ever noticed it there? Even though it's running in or running out, it runs north. Um, so, yeah, just cast up current if it come down. Um, you don't get much at Labrador here. But down near Lotus Creek is not a bad spot as well. Near the last jetty down to um, the flats at Lotus Creek. Right at Lotus Creek, a good yabby dig in there, as you probably know, on that corner. Um, back of the pool where the gentleman said earlier. It's not a bad spot as well. Um, and then where the, where the swing pool at the Southport, it's not a bad area at the back of that as well. Um, over on the spit here, um, along, that's the spit actually goes along there, you can't see if it's covered in yellow, because both sides of it work, but the, the, see what the east side, of, uh, west side of it, which is the main channel side, works heaps better than the Buns Bay side. So, if you, and where the rock wall ends and the sand starts, is a really good area. Okay, but you get a few snags, there's a lot of rocks still, isolated rocks out in the water there, but that's a really good area. Again, early morning, really good there. Widen. Um, down at, uh, you know, where the Gold Coast Bridge is down here. So that's Sea World. Is it going to be further south? Yeah, oh, yeah. covered up by the staff. But <laughs> that's the Gold Coast Bridge just there. Um, along that foreshore there, down to where the swimming gymnasium thing is. Um, along that foreshore there, it's not too bad. Where the big girls in the park there. That area is good as well. Um, Do you have any issue with eating? Um, I don't fish in there much at all, but I'd probably say it's a good point. Yeah. yeah. Is, it the paper last week, the water is, so is that right? Yeah. So it's very sediment doesn't move much in there. Yeah. That's why I fish that that side. It's better. Yeah. I wouldn't swim in there. Yeah. Probably a lot of brim there, I'd say. Yeah. Big yeah, the turdies. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I. Uh, sorry about the people at Bunce Bay there. But uh, yeah. That's um, that area there, um, especially where the rock wall meets the sand. I've caught some really good whiting there over the years. You know? Yeah, but if I had a, a spot to pick, shore based, um, at night time be down Ronaldo Bay 100% near Howard Street. Um, in the fish in the afternoon to say 8 o'clock at night uh, on the rising tide. If I was going to fish daytime, it'd either be down on the waterfront here at Labrador or over that spot there. That would be. Probably the pick of the bunch, and if you want a nice, a nice sort of view, a bit out away from everybody else, right at the end of Parallel's Point, there would be the pick. Okay. Um, how do you fish when you're land based there? It's exactly the same as we talked about before, but you're just using smaller sinkers. But in some areas, you might use a big sinker to get out a bit further. Okay, but using smaller sinkers. Um, if you got weed, you won't get many whiting around weed, you get a little whiting, you get a lot of diver whiting around weed, but you don't get whiting whiting. They don't like weed too much. So remember that no matter where you are fishing. They stay away from the weed a bit. I think because the flatties eat them. Okay. 
It's the unsafe area. Little ones don't seem to know different. Um, they're learning. Yeah, so um, that's about it there. Any questions on that at all? No? Okay. Um, any questions on, on this on off the shoreline fishing at all? No. Nah. So when you get your yabbies, guys, um, you're going to need an aerator. It's really important to keep your bait alive. It's so important. You need to change the water. You need to keep the water cool. That's the number one thing you have to do. Number two thing is you need to keep it aerated. Um, if you keep it aerated, say, um, at room temperature or a bit under, you might want to freeze some, one, one of your, one of your coke, run one of your ice trays, use it, fill it with salt water, clean salt water. And just put it, if you've got a bucket of, say, half full, just put it in one, even just one ice cube is enough to cool it down a bit and keep it cold for another few hours or for two, and you can leave it overnight with that going, and your bait will be super kicking clean in the morning. Okay, and then um, you could probably stretch it out to two days, but you need to change the water in the morning, and then do the same again, and then um, daytime, I might want to put three ice cubes in, into it. Just little ice cubes, salt water ones. Um, and if you put them in the fridge, the fridge is too cold generally, unless you want to turn it up a bit to maybe 10 degrees, but your wife would probably go mad. So you need, um, if you've got a specific fridge that you keep for fish or whatever, or something different, um, you need to keep it at probably around about 10, to 10 or 15 degrees. So they need to be a bit of cold, but they can't be cold, cold, because they'll go to sleep and sometimes they don't wake up. It's not the worms. But you need to keep your bait fresh. Unless you have access to go worming or yabbing every day, then you don't worry about all that crap. You just go get fresh bait again. <laughs> okay? But we tend, we tend to, our worms will stretch out about three or four days. Actually, this little fellow in here has been in <laughs> there. hasn't been in here. <laughs> the ice cube's too big for that. Um, I bought a live one on tonight, but I caught them on um, Monday afternoons, so that's three days ago now. Okay. Well, was it Tuesday morning? Monday afternoon and Tuesday morning, was it? Yeah, Tuesday morning. Yeah. Sorry, Tuesday morning. So he's only three days old. Uh, but he's still going to be alive because we're about to put a hook through him later. Sorry, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> but he doesn't know that yet. But um, he's still alive. <laughs> <laughs> You'll be right. Uh, but anyhow, so yeah, two, two or three days is a bit, bit, it's not really best to keep in that all day, which I've done since this morning. So, anyhow. Um, but that's about it for that, guys. Um, and now I'm going to go to boat, okay? Then I'm going to talk about how to do it all. So, oh, just one thing. When you fish up on the shoreline, I should tell you, um, it's a bit like boat fishing. From the beach, it's different. You've got to keep constantly winding your line and watching it. On the shoreline though, unless you've got a bit of a current happening and you need to keep the line coming towards you, don't touch your rods, okay? Put them on a bucket, lean them up against something, get yourself a sand spike um, or a rod spike or whatever. Watch your rod tips, probably put them on about, uh, around about that angle, so fairly flat, because you don't want the wind pushing them around. And the lower it is to the, to the water, the better it is and watch your rod tips. And if that rod tip moves just a little bit like that, um, you need to pick it up. And you always, when you pick up your rod, they feel you, they know you're touching it. As you pick it up, because yeah, you've got an LB, you can let out a bit of line as you're picking it up, and he doesn't feel you too much. But you can't do that with an egg beetle, because they don't, well, they go backwards, but they get tangled. So as you pick it up, the secret is to actually lean your hand forward as you're picking it up, a little bit of slack, and then just wait and close your eyes and feel it. You'll feel him taking it, taking it, taking it, and then you've got him, okay? But the secret is not to touch it until you see that little rod move first. It's all about watching it and knowing when it's ready. Obviously some fish are aggressive, they'll just whack it and hit it. So make sure your line's not set too tight or not too loose, because you don't want your rod to fall over and get dragged through the sand, especially if you use a bit better reel. Um, and so just set your drag, add a, an easy pace that you can sort of pull it off you can set the hook at the same time but it won't drag your rod off the rod stand does that make sense for yep. land sorry mate so that's for land based that's for land based yeah. and very similar for boat too okay very similar for boat too um, but yeah watch your rods don't hold them at night time it's really hard so you can do two things that's why you've got the bells 
that's the night time, okay? So you can listen for it. I hope there's not a cat walking past. They're aggressive and I'm ready for it. That's a cat. Uh, there's a lot of cats in those, <laughs> feral cats in that area, along the foreshore. Um, but um, I you sometimes use a little glow stick on the end there. Or don't use a headlamp because it's too aggressive on the water. It scares them away a bit. Um, they don't mind a bit of noise. They just don't like light too much in, on the water. The, the whiting brim's the same too. Uh, so put a glow stick on the end. They've got them downstairs. They last only for 12 hours, but you just um, crack them, the, the chemical inside, and they clip onto your rod, and you, you'll see them move really easy without any light. Because they're glowing like crazy. Um, leader, they're around about 50 centimetres, 45 centimetres. Any questions on that at all? Yes. Just on the main boats, I had a lot of fun with the poppers. Yep. Remember they had the old sticky poppers? Yeah. Yeah. Still, still work really good. Didn't talk about Lewis tonight, but, but it works really well. Is that right? But uh, uh, definitely still works. But you need running tide, and, and uh, that spot at Paradise Point is the go for that. It's one of the gun spots right at the end there. But from boat. Um, uh, yeah, no. Yeah, so I get into those. <laughs> that's, that's my, um, my go-to. So, um, for those of you who do catch beach worms, um, you can preserve them. So, how many people here catch beach worms again? That's good, I'm glad not many of you do it because you can only buy these. <laughs> Just joking. <laughs> uh, but no, how they work is, um, they're brine. So, they, they put them in a solution, right? And they're like um, metho, sugar, salt, salt water, food colouring. Okay, it's like a secret herbs and spices. Um, these are frozen, so they're freezer, but they're still they're still soft. They're like very pliable. They're like a live one, but they're frozen. We sell them downstairs, mate. Yeah. So, but they're expensive. I don't know if you know if those of you have bought beach worms. So, you know, yabbies are expensive. Beach worms are even more expensive. So I don't know what they are. I think they're in like. You know, Four bucks each, is it now? Yeah, containers, the little ones, ten, nine bucks, and the big ones, sixteen. But um, they're expensive, very expensive. But but you get, you probably get thirty baits out or forty baits. So yeah, but I find yeah. like everyone, they might like put it in a beach bag. Yeah. Put it back in the freezer. Hundred percent, mate. They yeah. Soften up and they freeze again. Yeah, that's right. They're, they're really good. They're, they've been brined and, and it's a great solution that toughens them right up. And the colouring compared to old mate here is a lot more aggressive, very red. So again, I don't know if it's because of uh, the colour, it's more like a bloodworm that they, they like it better in the estuaries, I'm not sure. But they definitely do work, yeah. So that's your go-to, yeah. Um, okay, so boat fishing, we have the boat fishing now. So I won't talk about spots until we get to it. But, uh, but with boat fishing, um, I use a shorter rod. Um, I used to use long rods. I fished club competition for many, many, many years with um, AAA clubs. The other days when we probably didn't know any better and rape and pillage and I don't want to say having what we caught in some nights, but as well in the hundreds. Um, and we weren't allowed to keep them under 23 or 25 centimetres we used to fish, so a lot of fish. It's a lot of big eskies. Um, but I learned a lot about catching fish in those clubs. But these days I would never do that. Um, but so those days I used to use 11 foot 4, 10 foot 6 rods, 6 inch LVs. That was the go to. That's what we used to use. And uh, I don't know how my mates used to do it. I used to fish with a gentleman named Robbie Miller. He's such a great fisherman. He taught me so much. And um, he was about 50 when I was like 25. And I don't know how he could sit in the rod because <laughs> he didn't like much light on the boat. Well, I had problems there. But I don't know how, at his age, he could have seen it. And I, I know I'm that age now, and I could definitely, definitely not see it. <laughs> but that, this is a short run, it's way out there, you know. Um, but he used to watch your rod tips. You'd never hold your rods. As I said before, they know you're holding your rod, okay? If you're on the beach. But when you're in the boat, you don't. And when you're on the shoreline, you don't hold your rods. You watch your rod. And you know, you learn when's the right time to pick it up. So you'll see them, and sometimes they'll the play with it. And the ones that are playing with it are the ones that are actually getting a bit easier because they're swallowing it right down their backside. Okay? The ones that are going dun 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 
they're pecking at it, whether it be from that way or that way, or maybe they're stupid and they're going to take the whole thing. But um, they're the ones that are harder to catch. So they're the ones, the ones that are going dun 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 dun, and little little dun dun. You wait for them to actually start to take that tip over. They'll either go to run with it, or they'll you'll just see the rod tip go a bit tight like that. They're on there, ready to swallow it. So they're the ones that are easy to catch. Um, the only thing is, I've never had uh, rarely a hook come out, but um, because he's using really light line, I mean, some of my rods are only four pound line back those days, and still are. I like having a bit of fun with whiting. This one here is only, I think that's only four. Very small, you can have it later if you want. It's very, very small. Um, and four pound braid. And um, my mono lines, yeah, four, six, eight, ten would be the heaviest I've ever used, but that's because it's left open brim season, maybe. So eight was pretty popular. Uh, six and four would be my light one, they're a bit finicky. So we used to have like four or five rods, and we'd use it, only use, I'd use two rods at once and we'd use the two that were right at the time. Um, but when you go, when you do those big whiting on like 40 to 45 centimetres, and when they fight hard, and if you're too aggressive on them, uh, they'll just snap your line or snap your leader. So um, that's the only time I ever would lose fish occasion would be the line and snap, because I was just a bit anxious to get the boat and get back out there again. So um, be careful when you get when you're in a boat, they tend to be a lot more diving than they are on the shoreline. So you'll lose the big ones easy your line will break. If you use too heavy, you don't get bites. So you've got to take the good with the bad, fish light, and uh, and understand, with, with egg beaters, it's really good to get the drag. So when they want to run, this goes ding, 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 and then run. When, it, when it's not running, you, you can just go a bit harder. Um, but with an LV, you have to learn to wind it backwards when he's taking it, and then take it back in. But if you get that method in your head, when's the time to let go? Depending on the size line you're using, that's when you become a good fisherman and it becomes easy. Is it? So how many people use Elvis? Yeah, good. So still, no, I still use them too, but with the kids I use these because <laughs> they're easy. Uh, and they're easy for me to catch fish as well. Um, but anyhow, you, it's all about um, those big ones. You need to let them be able to pull the line off because you'll lose them. They'll break your line. Um, brim, so when you're fishing for whiting, brims you buy catch. It's funny, when you're fishing for brim, you catch them brim, but when you're fishing for whiting, they're a pain in the ass. Uh, so, um, and when you get a hook at brim, you'll know straight away, it comes straight to the top. The whiting dig down deep all the way to the back of the boat, and even more around the back of the boat. Uh, so, um, when you get a brim on, just, if it's on the surface, just go hard, get him in, get him back out there. Unfortunately, brim tend to swallow them very easy because they're little hooks. So, how do you not kill the brim? You just got to cut it off and retie your hook, and let him worry about the hook later. Sort of thing. Does that make sense? Yep, good. Um, sinker size, brim are different. Brim like little sinkers, they're like finesse. Whiting don't give a shit. <laughs> they don't care if it's a size four ball sinker, a one ball sinker, or a zero ball sinker. When you fish out of the boat, they don't really care. Um, so um, I do change down a bit lighter when it gets high tide because um, I think it matters then. But when the current's running, you better have a bigger sinker than a lighter sinker It's not getting to the bottom of that good. Or it might get a bit of weed caught on it and lift it up and start spinning and then you're wasting your time sitting there waiting for a bite nothing happening because it's off the bottom and it's spinning and there's a bit of weed wrapped around it. You get that big sinker and it holds on the bottom, the bait's just sitting there and it's doing its thing and you get a lot more fish. Okay? So don't be scared to use too big a sinker when you're fishing for whiting. But in saying that, I wouldn't go any heavier than say, if I fish up in the Rang River and it rips up in the Rang River in the council chambers here, um, about a four ball, but it's about as big as I use. So you all know what a four ball is, so pass it around and I'll pass it around. Um, and a one ball would be about the size I'd use on the bottom of the tide. Do you want to throw that to you, Alex? Excuse me. Thank you, mate. Uh, we were they? Oh, did they bag out? Yeah. yeah. I, I went the Monday before, so two weeks ago, yeah. or the week before, um, and it was really hard going. Oh, we got about 20, I think, or 18. Um, but we only fished for about three hours at the council chambers, which is yeah. uh, this yeah. diagram here you're going to show you about. Oh, okay. Yep. Yeah. Um, but um, the size wasn't as good as I got up in Pimara and Puma yeah. recently, and that was during the day. Yeah, yeah a lot more consistent. Yeah. So, how many people have fished up to council chambers at all? Not in the right spot. Not for the right spot. No, this is a good spot. <laughs> so, how many people have heard about it and want to fish up there and try it? Okay, 
it's a really good spot. The, the ideal tide there, I believe, is um, if you can get high tide right on dusk and you fish the first two or three hours of the run out. So you get the last hour of the run in, turning dark, and then it changes and then it's got full dark and the tides just start to run out and then it starts running out. Um, that's the perfect scenario. Um, I never c catch many there during the day, but I get lots during the night time on that tide. Night time? Yeah. yeah. When was that, mate? Last weekend? Last weekend. Which would have been opposite tides. It would have been um, uh, a high tide at the moment. Oh, no, that's a right tide, sorry. Yeah, high tide at the moment is around about um, midday, isn't it? Yeah, it is, yeah. Okay, so yeah, it was good tides last week. Sorry, yeah, good tide. That's that tide I was talking about. <laughs> um, oh, thanks, mate. <laughs> Cheers. Thank you. Uh, so, okay, so here's the go. So, I don't know what they call the art centre there now, Sota or Suta or something? Oh, Hoita. 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 <laughs> There's my Hoita. Um, there's a jetty there, and there's a building here. And the old lake used to be in here, okay? Does that all make sense? Yeah. So that's Chevron Bridge West Side, Chevron Bridge Surface Side, Bundle Road Bridge, and um, the channel sort of goes, there's a bit of walkway bridge across here now. The channel sort of goes around like that, and then you come up this way. Okay, and that's heading up. That's sh oh, the free bridge down there, the new one. Okay, can you all see that from the back? Okay, yep, cool. Um, so there's a beacon just here. Um, is it red or black? I can't remember. I think it's the red, yeah. Um, and the greens are down here, it's two greens down here. Um, but the bank is where this red part is here, that's the bank. Okay. It's around about four or five foot deep, and this side over here is about 20. Quite deep and aggressive current. Okay. A bit strong current here too. Um, but on the running tide, um, I like fishing this corner here. Okay. Um, I'm fine and if I'm anchored up there or there, it doesn't matter. Fishing at this edge is really good. Um, but as soon as that tide comes around, you've got to, when you're up there, if you've got there on weekends, you understand what I'm talking about. It's like 20 boats. Between here and here, which is about 200 meters, and you have to think, okay, it's going to be high tide at 7 p.m. and I'm up there at five. Do I position myself for the run out tide and just wait and get the odd whiting, <laughs> or do I go over here and smash them and get 20 or 10, and then someone's going to get my parking spot when the best fishing comes on? So you, always you sacrifice, you, you wait. Okay, unless you want to become politically incorrect and go right next to some guy who's going to throw a sinker at you or a knife. Um, but, yeah, so the best position is I like to anchor myself pretty well just a little bit up from that beacon and just inside of it. So you all know that is my, the best spot. The north side. Ah, south side, mate. So that's north. So, and that's south. And the beacon's there. Sorry for you guys that you can't see this. <laughs> the beacon's there, and um, you need to be yeah, anchored up about 15 or 20 feet that side of it, up to the south side of it, and maybe 10 foot in from it. And the reason being is um, when that tide swings the other way, you're going to go back this way because now you're facing. Oh, no, sorry. Yeah. No, that's right. That's right. Sit there. Cast, you want to be able to cast your line all the way along this edge here and out the back there. Actually, anywhere from there down to about 20 foot that side is fine too, it doesn't matter. Six metres that way. But as long as you're fishing in this area on the run out tide, um, it's a no brainer. And there are times over the years that I've found that sometimes I'll be in this deep over here, see so that bank goes like that. There's a deep area just along here in front of this little stone fence thing here. Mark, mark it pre-made concrete stone with a fence. Um, and just the front there's a the deep area, it's about 15 or 18 foot deep. And out the front here is like about 10. And in, sometimes I sit in that drain, we've just absolutely smashed them. So they've, for some reason, moved from here and gone into there and caught heaps. And other times I've been out in the middle here, on this edge of bank where it drops off here, anchor up about here, and just caught heaps here as well. So um, with whiting, they work in uh, schools and the schools will sometimes be 
um, feeding for two hours if you just keep pulling and pulling and pulling. Um, and then there'll be nothing for like 10 minutes and you think, oh, I'm gonna move. But you'd have to learn to stay. This is another school that comes through. And you might get another hour of fishing. And they just keep moving down. Or if it's been like 20 minutes and you don't get one, you gotta try and find that school where it's moved down to. You gotta cut off at the next pass. So then, as I said, they might have moved from there to there, or they might have moved from there to there, or might have moved down here somewhere. You've got to try and find where they've moved to. And they're very hard to see in the sound because there's so much crap and bubbles and seaweed that going with that strong current. You can't really see them on the bottom, but they'll be on an edge. That's the secret, they'll be on an edge. Did you say night or day? This is night time. This is up, this is Narang River's night time fishing. It's really weird. Pimpama and Coomera are daytime fishing spots. You get a lot of vermin like caddies and brim at night, not many whiting, but um, marine daytime you only get brim and stuff, um, but you don't get any whiting. But go to night time you get whiting, <coughs> and daytime at the other two spots they, the whiting come on the bite big time. When it gets dark they disappear again. Too many sharks I think they go and hide. Um, but yeah, so that's a really good spot. Okay, uh, there's a for those who are land based, there's a park here heading down. It's on um, Sunset Boulevard, if you know what that is. Okay, Sunset Boulevard, there's a park here. And that park, you cast out that big four ball sinker out as far as you can get it. Sometimes they're on the edge of the rocks here, but um, I, I tend to like this area here. This, the northern side of the park, it's a really good spot for land base, particularly just on dark. I put them in the early morning too. Um, but definitely um, just on dark and after dark. And um, I've caught them run in tide there, I've caught them run out tide there. Okay, it's a good high tide spot too, by the way. Um, that's really the area. I've also caught them in the boat along this edge here too, just in front of all the jetties. So there's greens there, um, and you're right on the edge of that. This is actually a bit of a bank in the middle here, and you're right on the edge of that, of that edge of that. Um, Bank. And the bank's about 400 metres long and 300 metres long. That's really there. Um, there's a little island here, a little alcove here with houses on it. Um, at the front of there, in the middle of the river, is another great spot. Um, I've caught a run in, run out tide there. And um, I've got them over the deep over here as well. And then down past the Island Capri Bridge, um, I've caught in the middle out here. But the only place I've caught a few fish during the day is around this area, not this area. I know people do catch them here during the day, some afternoons, but this is a better area, I think. Um, and there's a big bank comes on here, and that's the entrance to Little Talabudger Creek, which is Cascade Gardens, okay? So there's a green out the front there, and we fish on that side of the green, um, on the high tide, or run in, and the first to run out, and then we fish, the, we fish in the edge of the bank here. And on the run out, we might reposition near the green and cast this area here. and. Um, Sometimes the water in there, are, this next two months is really good. Okay, and you, when you're there, drop your sand crab pots up here, along this straight. Get the sand crabs as well. And you get quite a few um, fish bitten by sharks there, a lot of sharks there. Um, bull sharks, where they are. You get whiting, take your whiting, put the lot of sharks hit my whiting there too. And one night we were fishing there and I had a brim on my line. This is a club, and um, I, my other rod took off, so I quickly just dropped the brim. It's just like just on the surface, out this is night time, and I got the whiting in, and my rod went boom, <laughs> and the shark grabbed the brim at the back of the boat, like right there. So I was, I was washing my hands in a bucket of water after that. It's always really so I wash my hands. And I was like, Jesus, yeah, that was right there. So it's a really good area to fish this whole area here, but it's a night time area. Okay. Would you ever go would I want, sorry mate? Burl. Burley them? Yeah. Um, okay, so I've done the burly thing many, many, many times. Um, I used to use crushed up soldier crabs, leftover yabbies, sand, yeah. a bit of tuna all mixed in it. Um, it does work, but I find it really brings the brim and toadies in. Yeah. To toadies especially, like when the toadies come in on the river, their whole school's massive. So <laughs> once you start catching toads, you only catch toads. And they just chew your line up and then nibble above, because you pull the worm up over the, over the hook. They nibble the line above the hook and then if they get good whiting and it falls off, you know. 
So I try not to burly much. Man. I prefer to find the fish and just work them rather than burly them up. Yep. Uh, I have, yeah, they're really good in front of but the spots they work too, like um, many, many years ago I did really well with those in front of the boys' school at TSSC in the Little River, uh, fishing uh, daytimes, actually I've put them in daytime too. Um, but up here, um, I have used them over the years, they're going to be the little grey ones, the little tiny ones, put about four of them on your line, um, and same with the little grassy shrimps, you can't catch those anymore, the glass shrimps, you can't use the net to scoop them anymore apparently, I've been told the fisheries book, book one of my customers. Let me know about that if you can. <laughs> That's what I've been told. Um, you can't use them to, to get, you can't use a scoop net to get them, and it's illegal to catch them that way. You're only going to catch them in a shrimp trap. I don't know. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. It's in the other way. Uh, but that's that area. Any questions on that at all, guys? So when I talk about council chambers, that's what I'm talking about. All that. What about looking like down in Victoria? We used to get in these wires and they used to bash. Uh, uh, sorry, squid. Yep. Yeah. yeah, different up here, mate. That, that, it's really funny, Alex. You get the little diver whining, the smaller ones. I don't know you can George down there, but you get diver whining on squid, both in the Broadwater and in Moreton Bay, especially, yeah. uh, on strips of squid. Um, they're a smaller fish and they are very aggressive for what for squid, but um, we don't get the, the yeah. summer whining so much on squid. Yeah. Very rarely. But in saying that, guys, I've heard customers catch them off the pump and jetty fish for tail on, on a three gang hook. Yeah. But they're good ones. Yeah. Yeah. So they eat anything, but their favourite foods, worms or yabbies. Yeah. Okay, um, this, I just want to tell you before I go any further on, on the boat fishing. Um, this is still boat fishing, but this is um, walking, I didn't talk about this, walking the foreshore. So this cell, same scenario will work over here at Labrador near Chara Seafood on those big banks I was telling you about. So what you do is the best time to fish it is at low tide and the first hour of the run up. So if you've never done that with unweighted yabbies at all, such good fun fishing and so productive. I know Clint from, um, uh, we've been doing it for years, but Clint from um, Brad Smith Charters yeah. has been doing it and he's clued up too about it. And yeah, that's where it's, yeah, it's exactly that is way break. <laughs> And this is how we do it. And we've been doing this for years. And um, since the kids are little tiny kids. Um, and it's great fun because it's, you just hop off and you puck the boat up, get your yabbies, it's low tide, easy to get yabbies. And then you just fish them with that, whatever rods, the smaller rods actually cast better than the bigger ones in this scenario, because you don't need to get much, <coughs> such a long swing out. Um, and we're using light line, like really light, using the same hooks and um, or I use the long shank sometimes because they um, they fit a yabby better because you've got the small yabbies and um, and they're using a, a 10 pound leader about a half a metre so what you do is you park your boat over at that side I normally park it where it's, the sand's always out there for a long time and then walk put the shoulder bag on um, one of these things sorry and bait bucket and put the fish in there or take a a bucket with it if you want. Um, and we do it both sides, but we normally start this side here, and it needs to be low tide. So if you get low tide about six in the morning or five in the morning, um, go pick up yabbies, and then you just go to here, and there's a few houseboats in here, and you try and find where the edge is, which has weed, and they sit, it's every time they do sit in the weed, <laughs> they sit around the weed, and then as soon as that tide starts to come up, you need about um, knee depth of water, so you're fishing in knee depth. So the water's actually, the shoreline's actually 15 metres behind you, and it's like that deep all the way up to the shoreline, right? And you're in knee depth. And, um, and you're casting just to that edge. Now, the secret is the whiting don't actually come around behind you too much, they work with the water temperature. So the water in the shallow water is very warm, you feel it's warm, right? But you keep walking out, it's the secret, you keep walking out until you feel that first bit of cooler water. You don't have to go up to here. It's just, <laughs> it's just the clean water coming in, right? And, um, and that's, that's got to stay with you the whole time. Does that make sense? So if you step back and it's st still cool, you need to go back further because it's already pushed up. And they're pushing up with that water temperature change. They're not pushing up because the water's getting deeper in the shallow water. It's already, they could already get in there if they wanted to, but it's too warm for them. So 
that's the secret for fish in this whole back area here, is to understand the difference in that step and that step. And you just keep working back with it. So you get a couple of whiting, and then I go a bit quiet it's because they've come closer to you, but you're scaring them. So you need to step back a bit. And once you get to that warm bit again, stop, and then cast just in front of you again, like 10 meters in front of you, and you start catching them again. And if you do that same scenario over on the other map at Charas, um, just up from Charles, behind the tuna there, on the beach. Uh, it's the same thing, it's a big flat. Get right up to the end, low tide, and work with the water temperature, stepping back as the water's coming up. You fish for about two hours that way. And then once it gets up, and it's filled up the back here, with that cooler water, there everywhere, it's really hard to find them. So you've got about a two hour window to catch quite a few. Okay, first the running tide. And uh, you do get them up there in a the high tide, sometimes, if the tide's on the next weekend's high in the morning, uh, then we go right up to the back here, right on this edge, and just drift the edge, or use electric, whichever, in about that deeper water, and fishing um, unweighted, uh, yabbies again, and we do really well whiting right up the edge. Okay? Yeah, so with the yabbies, um, with the yabbies, uh, I... Sorry for the bad drawing. See that big nipper? Break it off first thing. I don't think they like that sitting in their head when the fish is trying to bite them, they don't like that big nipper. <laughs> so get rid of it. Um, this is at the bottom, this carrot space, that's his legs, that's his eyes there. And this is his little, what I call little flaps. And that's his tail there, okay? So, and that's the hard part of his head, right there. So what I do is, I put the hook in right here, underneath, so it's upside down, and I go in, 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 um, and then when I get to around here, and it's up near the eye of the hook, or no, here's the so, um, up to the top of the hook, I then pull him up um, above the eye of the hook. So now, um, there's a bit of a gap here, you know, so I stick the hook through here, and I come out, and I never go in that way, and I never go the other way. If you go that way, or the other way, you generally break that piece off his head, which is the part you need to keep it all intact, right? So it damages it. So you go through the side of his head with the hook. Does that make sense? So it goes through there and out there. Don't go, don't go that way. <laughs> yeah. And you pull that up above the eye of the hook. So the eye of the hook now is about here, internal, and that's line, and the line comes out there. Does that make sense? Yeah. You thought with yabbies, like once they've had a touch, they're gone. So they're yeah, so the, head, if the head normally gets bitten first, that's why the hook's got to be down that end. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, if the head's bitten up, sometimes if that's that much, but that's all gone, that's left, I'll pull it up up the line and put another yabby on. But that's for brim and flatties now. But for whiting, they don't like too big a yabby. They like the little one, like I was talking about, middle one, middle size, so I discard it and just put another yabby on. They're cheap if you're digging them yourself. Oh, yeah, yeah. Like yeah. Like yeah. Nah. That's, oh, you mean as in sit down in the water waiting yeah. for it to come back? Yeah, generally, mate, yeah. They're, they're very, a worm, they'll come back right to the last little bit. Yeah. Yabbies, they'll look at it and soon why. <laughs> A dime a dozen, I guess. Yeah, so that's the best way to put it on there. Yeah, yeah cool. Um, but getting back to here, just try that, guys. Have a go. It's really good fishing and really beautiful. It's such beautiful to be out in the water, knee depth. Whether it be there or on the shoreline, same scenario. It's really uh, good. Dougie, for that inside wave break, that now's the time of the year. Now's the time of the year, hundred percent. Yep. So I believe like they're, they're up the river already, but um, I think they're definitely on the beach and coming in, yes. coming in. Um, and they generally yeah, hang around this they, area. How long do they hang around? Oh, we put them there till February, I guess. Okay. Yeah, we put them all year round there, actually. But, yeah. but predominantly, yes, late September to December, January. Yeah. I think this is, there must be lots of whiting in there because they're there, they're up there, they're up there, they're down there. They're all over the joint. Um, I've caught a lot of them out here in the run out tide, fishing big things like those four ball. Um, anchored up, that's where the six knot yeah. four is, just back a bit from it, towards the front here, just in the middle of the channel there, but in line with the buoy. So 
so no one runs me over. Um, and that's a good spot for a uh, run out tide. But it runs really hard. Yeah, it rips through there, but they but they're big wide in there, guys. So, and at night time, um, let me get back to that map again. So, okay. Yep, that's it. Right? So that's that spot there. I'm telling you about just here on the run out tide right there. Thanks, mate. Um, that's a really good area. That's that whole back area we fished as in walking on back away break. Um, haven't caught much on this side. It's all been on that north side. But if you just bring the map down a bit for this one, uh, otherwise, sorry. Yep. So thank you. Um, so I've caught them all. That, that actually, that's not right. That should be down through here. But oh, you know that bank that comes out and then exposed at the end of the rock wall on the north side of way break. Oh wait, oh, seaway. Sorry. So the rocks come along here. They stop here. There's a bit of beachy trees, and there's a little bay in there. Or well, there's a little sandbar here, and the channel's over here. On that edge there at night time, I've done really well mining at night time and the run out tide. So if you want something different, um, just put across a big creek to there, it's really easy. And and you get some really big whiting, you know, like worms or yabbies there, they don't mind either or. And get lots of stingrays though, but you get heaps of good whiting there at night time. Um, let's go down a bit further, Sandra. Isn't that where the old deep hole used to be? Uh, deep hole used to be up here. Mm -hmm. Up here, a bit further up. Um, that big bank on the end of Crab Isle, let's go a little bit further down, I might get to it here. Um, I've caught lots of them here during the day, just drifting. Um, and sometimes on the high tide, they're really close to the mangroves there. Um, we get a lot of garfish there too in season, but the whiting there are really good. Um, and also on this edge, this, this edge just down here, there's a lot of sailboats more along here. It's along that edge there. But yeah, that area there is really good. Um, and then back the other way, Simon. Down. Yeah, uh, right to the bottom, Simon. So one of my favourite other places, so in the Narain River when they go a bit quiet at night time, we used to go out in the broadwater and sometimes they, they really move down the broadwater I think, because they just rock up in the broadwater. <laughs> and, uh, and where the Saatchi is and the, all the marinas are here, um, there's the first green, there's a six knot zone just back here, and then the next side green which is um, opposite sort of that swimming park thing, um, but on the main channel side. Um, right on the edge where the green is, there's fish next to the green along that edge of that bank down to um, the six knot sign, which is about a three or four hundred meter stretch along there. On the edge of the bank, you've got a lot of white in there as well. Okay, on the run out tide, but it has to be night time. Okay, they haven't caught in the run in tide, just run out. And you'll get them um, a few daytime drifting around this area here. So when I was a kid, um, I used to dig all my yabbies here for a bait shop over here called Mitchell's Jetty. About 50 years ago, that's a while ago. Well, not 50 years ago, 45 years ago. Um, and we, I've been catching one in there since then, so ever since. Because when I was catching yab uh, getting yabbies, we used to just chuck a whiting line out and get a feed of whiting while we just got the line set and they'd be swallowed it right down their backside and pull them up every now and then. But um, that still fishes well the back of that bank today. You want to know where that is? It's opposite Lotus Creek, opposite the Southport Smith Street boat ramp, but on the east side of it. Very good spot. And dig yabbies there too, still. Um, you'll get them on the flats over here, fishing the same way as back away break, too, guys. I haven't sussed it out really well yet, but I've caught fish down that works the same way. Um, and that's a little aisle on there with a lot of trees on it now. That area is good too. If you want to walk, wade the water. Um, any questions on that at all? No? Okay, good. Okay, putting the worm on. Go. So that's about it on the spots, okay? If I give you enough spots, you should better catch fish. I want to see, want to see pictures. Okay, um, put the worm on. Okay, I have a little one of those hooks you got in your bags there. It's a size 4 Shinto bait holder. And I'm going to do a live worm and a dead worm, which I was asking about before. So, what I do, guys, I don't like wasting worms because they're hard to catch and they're expensive, right? Simple as that. Um, and with a dead worm, it doesn't matter if you cut at the front or the back, they don't break up. But if you, and use scissors, scissors are really good for worms. You try and do your hand thing, 
is squash it. Sometimes I break in, live ones I break up a fair bit. So if the worm's the skinny end of the worm, which is this end here, I make it a bit longer. Because you've got to keep feed on, feed on, feed on, otherwise it looks too skimpy. If it's the fat end, you want just enough to cover your hook. Does that make sense? So the skinny end like this, I'll probably put, even my hook's only small, I'll put that much on it, because it's only skinny, right? And what I always do, I know you can't see it in the back, but I have shown this on the YouTube, I think. But I start down about that far down from the top, okay? Which is about eight mil or something like that. So I don't actually go through the top part, I just go down a bit. And then thread it up, and I just keep threading it up and threading it up. When you get a live worm, sometimes it'll pop out, which you'll see in a minute. When I get down the bottom there, I just leave a little tiny dag at the bottom, but not much. But I'll pull that top part up over the eye of the hook. Right. And you'll see that little... Oops, sorry, right? The top rods, it's fine. You see that little, um, that little tag sticking to the side there? The reason why I do that is, and I believe, and I don't know if works, is um, in the current, when your line's sitting there, and this thing's moving around a little bit, that's wiggling like it's alive. And even though it's a dead worm, it just works so good. If you put it through the top, and I've done this, and use it, I don't get the bites of the rod that's got the wiggle part. Because I've got to learn to do a lot of different things, you know, so to, so you guys can catch fish. And uh, it definitely helps. So I'll pass this around a bit of paper and have a look. Now, this is a skimpy part of the worm, so if it was a fatter piece, it looks a lot nicer. But I'll use a fat piece on the next guy. It's a live one. Especially thanks for that. So the live one, um, when you put a live worm on, you can never put it from the um, bottom up. That's when they break into a thousand pieces. Have you ever used wriggler worms? Who uses wriggler worms here? Yeah, so if you ever use wrigglers, they just like disintegrate into a thousand pieces. But if you go from the head down, they don't do that. Okay. And beach worms are the same too. So, buddy. So, I'm using a piece about that big. Okay, on the live one, like so. On the hook here somewhere, there we go. So, same deal, starting down about that far from the top. Okay. Really important to keep that top part, especially the live boy, he'll wriggle around low the joint. Although I've made here is not the best condition. How do you tell worms are getting sick is they go very white. Okay. Or black in bugworms, for instance. Now this is this one is a little bit different. You'll see um, what I'm getting at with the because the body's bigger. Ouch. Sharp hooks. Um, thanks, Alex. So it's not the best looking worm at the moment, but <laughs> So I decided to bring a yabby and guys to put it on to show you, mate, but um, if you do it that way, you should be right. I don't know if you're doing that way now. Are you doing that way now? I'm not through the head. Through the side, yeah, through yeah. the side of the head, yeah. Yeah, don't ever poke it out before the head because the head just falls off yeah. and they'll just leave the rest sitting there. Yeah. Yeah, you, you need to, you need to um, do it that way. So that'll come around. Um, I think that's about all I need to tell you guys. Just with widening... The measure at the moment is 23. We normally don't keep them under 25 because to me, 23 is too small. But if you're not catching much, I guess it's still feed. <laughs> um, 25 centimetres is sort of half decent size of whiting. Um, and actually, for us, I think in New South Wales, they're 28 or something. It's quite a bit bigger. So I, I suggest 25. Um, but have a measuring stick, anyhow. So when you measure a fish, you know, you just pull the tail straight. And, uh, and push the head up against the, that part, and that's the measurement. Um, when you're filleting whiting, um, I should have brought whiting on tonight, but I didn't. But um, use a blade that's quite thin and quite flexible. Don't use a... Third <laughs> Use a blade that's quite thin and quite flexible. It's really important, okay? That's really important. And, um, and sharp, of course. And um, don't use the fat type blades like you use for doing a snapper or a mackerel or something. So it's all about finesse and getting over their rib cage, and skinning is really important as well. Skin them right as well. Uh, whiting is very easy to clean. Um, has anyone ever used a scaler bag on whiting at all yet? 
and scale them. But they're really nice. Their skin's very nice to eat if you use the skin on it. Um, scaler bag is um, this type of thing here. It's just a cheaper version. But how they work is um, you tie a piece of rope to the front of the scaler bag. I generally would tie a float to the end, like a crab pot dilly float sort of thing, or, or about a four inch ball float, just so it doesn't sink in case the rope breaks. Um, you tie it at the front, you put a little whiting in there. Um, this bag's about, I'm going to pull it out, so big. And um, you put all the whiting in there, you tie the top off, chuck it out behind the boat while you get slightly going forward. Drop it back on the first wave, so you run about when you're doing so, and get up to, on the plane about 15 to 18 knots. Yeah, like that. <laughs> and uh, you can say that though. If you stop me, you've got to be quick to pull it in because I'll be watching it, they will follow it forever. That's mine, finally stopped. Um, and you tow it for about 2Ks at that speed, 2 or 3Ks. So you put the whiting in there, just throw them in there. You've got a float tied to the end, you're clipped onto the end. You put them in there, you pull it tight, you just do it, a hitch or whatever. Um, use that one of those shark clips as the best thing on the rope, and you just clip it through that part there, and then you throw it behind the boat on about six or eight mil rope, drop it back probably about from here to the mile on the wall, they're not quite the back there. And, uh, and then just cruise along at 15 or 18 knots for about two k's. And when you pull it in, sometimes sometimes their heads are ripped off, but they're completely scaled and they're ready to just fill it, fill it. Okay, so it's widely a bit messy in the kitchen. You want to scale it? Okay, little scales are painful, but then Victoria, that's all they do. That's all they do. Garfish, whiting, well, that's their main species they catch. They don't, they don't put snapper in there, <laughs> but long skinny fish they do. Okay, um, just a couple of tools I want to show you about. Um, pliers, okay, when they're right down the back of their throat, I was going to show you how to do that, that's right. I'll show you about it first. So with the whiting, looking at underneath his mouth, again, excuse my, my drawing here. I think it's sort of like that scenario. I don't know how that part goes. <laughs> and that's his body. But um, and that's his mouth there and his eyes are on top on the other side. Um, but what you need to do is you put your thumb in here and you split it that there and that opens his whole bottom up. Just one move the thumb in and that right at that joint there and up to there and it just opens it up. Okay? And then you just grab your line and pull the line down like that and there's the eye of the hook sitting here. It's, you just grab the hook and pop it out. So you learn to do that when you're club fishing because time is the essence. <laughs> so that's how it is. But if you want to operate on it, I'll just cut your hook off. That's up to you guys. Um, but what I do sometimes, because some of those little shorter shanks are a bit hard to bend because they have no length on them to bend and sometimes that's right down here. Just get a pair of those and just push up and pull out at the same time, just a pair of pliers. They're, they're good. If your hook does bend, just bend it back a little bit. But as I was saying, after two or three bends, you've got to get rid of the hook and put a new one on. Um, so, yeah, the video is Yeah, see it from now. Um, the video shows about, doesn't it? Uh, I think it does, yeah. Uh, that's about it, guys. When you're winding line on, you're welcome to bring your reels in, we'll put it on for you, okay? If you've got a, a reel that you want to put the line on, just drop it in. Um, I think that's about it. Oh, yeah, when you're beach fishing back on the beach, or worming, when you're worming, it's a pain in the ass to take, if you're good at getting worms, you pull them all the time. Just make sure you wear one of these, that's your worm thing, put them into. Same thing, yabby digging, or uh, yabby digging, I use a sieve. But um, when you're out in the boat, uh, when you're at the beach, it's too far to walk back up to the bucket all the time, so just use one of those. And then put them in clean water. Um, if you are on the beach, if you've got a bucket that's got a lid on it, I suggest you fill it with salt water. That good salt water is really good to keep the bait alive a lot longer. If you get it from the canal or something like that, it doesn't seem to last as good. Okay. Ah, that's probably about it, I think. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So I'm going to show, show you a quick video. Sorry to bore you with it, <laughs> but it's, it was just the other day when I went up and I was catching a few. I just want to show you how I do it real quickly. And I won't, I don't know if you can hear down the back because that fan's pretty noisy on that projector. Um, if you just want to, oops, sorry, Alex. 
That's a large moment. I'll go the other way. No, I don't know. Mate, do you mind just flick the switch on the lights there, my friend, if you don't mind? I'm turning off a few of the lights in here. Thank you. Great. So, <coughs> take this one here off. So, just, I'll talk you through it as I'm doing it. Um, and sometimes the video will talk itself through too. Oh, uh, we'll just, yeah, we'll start at the beginning. So my wife does all the editing, she's really good at it, so I can't do it at all. <clears throat> so most of these fish here are 30 centimetres plus, which are really nice eating size, of course. So it just starts off catching worms, right? So you need to be able to get that first couple of worms to understand how it works, but there's an art to it. And I was thinking about one day going down the beach because I was going to make it down there and I'll show you how to do it. If you want to come down, you all can come down. You need to all have a go at doing it. <coughs> Sometimes it's really hard like that you've got to pull them out with two hands. <laughs> it's a big one there. Yeah. So you can see the tide's fairly high there, it's about halfway in. So the same, the bottom tide's not the best. Can you hear that down the back? Mm -hmm. Can't get any louder, sorry. It's a bit less gastric. Mm -hmm. So what I'm talking about there is, um, when we used to dig work, uh, fish years ago to comp, we would spend two days getting those five worms and we had to have like hundreds of four worms or 150 four worms each to make, so we had enough of the comp on the night, which is a lot of worms and a lot of hard work. And if you dig mud worms and those hard it's absolutely disgusting. Right? So that's why they're so expensive, the, the blood worms, the uh, crib island worms. Um, but last year, um, I went and dug mud worms and my dad wouldn't go for fishing, so I took him out in 76. I went and dug the worms, now they killed me. <laughs> Recovered for two days and went fishing three days later. <laughs> and, uh, um, and we did really well. We got about, I don't know, 40 whining or 50 whining, and I was still whining when I was at home, so we don't know. And um, I had about a dozen half bits of worms left over. And that day, the next day, I put a Facebook, the next day, one of my good mates had taken a while, rang me and said, um, oh, you're getting, the, he's a good whiting fisherman. He said, I get to be whiting duck last time. So I said, yeah. And he says, do you want to go again tonight? And I said, oh, he said, well, I'm still recovering from digging those bubble worms. I don't want to get to dig them anymore. I don't have time to dig them. He goes, no, 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 just use beach worms. I said, mate, they're shit. They're crap. <laughs> I said, if I brought bubble worms along when I was fishing with the club, the guys would bash me up. This is this is not worth it, you know? And, um, and that's true, I tried beach worms back in the day, I didn't like them. But anyhow, so I said, okay. So I went, clicked out the beach, I caught about 30 worms or 40 worms. And um, then we went out that evening, and I had my blood worms. I said, you can use beach, my beach worms, I don't want Because you don't have time to go get them. So he put on beach worms, I put on my blood worms. He had three before they were cooking those. And he's not a better fish, but he's just the bait, I don't know. And I'm going, no way, you know. So. I switched to beach worms and we got like, we ran out of beach worms, we were like, I don't know, 50 or 60 worms the next time, or that night. And um, I ended up using the bits and pieces of bug worms, and we got a few on that too, but I had bug worms left over, no beach worms left over. So now I just catch beach worms because it's so easy. So, um, I don't know if they would dig bug worms again. So, what I'm talking about here, guys, is looking for ripples. I don't know if you know about ripples, but ripples are so important. They tell you how the, how the bottom is. So you don't need a sound, you just look for the ripples. And that edge, you see that edge along there? So I'm casting to that edge over there. And I think there are ripples just on this side here as well. So I've got two rods out on both sides of the ripples. That's where the edge is of the channel. What rivers is that one, Jack? That, I've been in two different rivers here. One's... Um, one is Pipamar, I think, and one is um, at the near Hope Island. Sorry, so it's smooth water, the shallow water. Smooth waters, um, it depends on the current too. 
So sometimes the smooth water is um, the channel and the ripples are on the, the, rip, if the... If it's running really hard, the ripples are the bank. Yeah. If the ripples... Um, it's not running really hard, it's generally in, in the channel. So the more harder it is, the more bigger ripples it's the bank. So shallow type. So there you're sitting... Uh, there I'm sitting, um, the current's not running hard there, so it's in the middle of the channel. And the edge is actually in the bank. So it's kind of hard. Yeah, but the next spot I'm at, you'll see it's other way around. Once the tide starts running. So you always fish the edges like that? Yeah, uh, uh, if something's in the middle of the river, yes, I do. Yeah, 100%. So with your worms, they're really slimy with the line, so you need to put them on like a towel or on the carpet or whatever. I know it's not good for the worms, but let them dry out a little bit in the sun, it makes it easy for them to look. Dry sand? Dry sand works well too, yeah, that's right. Dry sand works well. So, yeah, that edge, so I'm in the channel there, because that edge is actually shallow, but it's yeah. fast out, you can see it anyway. Yeah. Yeah. So the tide's starting to run now. And when the tide starts to run, it's out there fun, I always say. Um, the fish just come on the bite now, and you can see a lot more fish now. So you rarely get a fish that's hooked in the mouth, yeah, they're so always down the throat. So most of my rods are two to four kilos, and um, the lead is obviously 10 pounds. The reason I use 10 pounds too is sometimes I'll try and grab the line and pull the hook out, um, but if it's well stuck, I'll slip it. Very small sink, you can see that. Uh, that's because there wasn't much run that day. It was a, it was a, there's a bit of run now, but it was um, only a, I think it's a very neat, it's a neat tide, it wasn't a big tide. So I'm casting about 15 metres, that's it. So when you get back to the boat, they'll really dive down. At that point, just take it easy and you'll give them up. If they want to go like that, let them go. But the secret is to get the head out of the water. Once you get the head out of the water, you've got it. Yeah, that's the way I do it, mate. You're watching it live on <laughs> the worker, right? <laughs> So that one didn't swallow it, honestly. Now when you grab a whiting like that, they've got little sharp bits on their gill, they'll slip to the side of your hand really easy. So just be careful of that. It's not the bottom gill, it's the next one up. Yeah, and they smack you badly. So when they come on, you just keep catching them. So this is what it's like at night time when they're angry when they're on the bike. What's the bag on the whiting? It's in a stew. Okay, so these like days, like 20 to me is enough for us. Oh, that? That's 20 to me now. See how I split the lid then? You see that, guys? Yeah. See how the line comes down now? So it's that quick. Mm -hmm. Oh, no, this one's well, well and truly hooked. But it comes out just like that. You try and open the mouth up, you've got tiny mouths and plenty of pair of pliers in there to pull it out, it just doesn't work. It's too hard. If you're into catching broom and keeping broom, it's the same method. Okay? But broom's a bit hard to split because they've got a tougher jaw. Um, but whiting, I just um, throw them in the pilot, it's water there, you see. 
they swim around or they slowly die there. <laughs> um, but I'm only out in a couple of hours, so they're going to go home and go straight to the fridge. But it, it, I've never really thought of it like being one. Uh, I think you could cut their throat and not much would come out. Yeah. They've got that sort of brown blood, it's like a weird blood on the flesh, but um, it eats well, so it doesn't work out too much there. But all fish, uh, especially reef fish and that, yeah, definitely. But So what I'm doing here is, because um, the tide's roof running in, I'm sort of just going to throw the edge of that bank, as you see with the carnival part there, and, uh, and sort of come down on that edge. I think I get a bite pretty quick, but you don't know. <coughs> if you don't get a bite uh, in, when they're on the bite, if you don't get a bite in a couple of minutes, I'd definitely check your line because your bait's probably gone. Or while you're getting the other fish in, it's bit it and you didn't notice it. Um, this is generally a chance of no bait in the line. It's not like those last couple of fish, the wave comes through on this one, not one, but one little bit of So what I'm saying there is they come through in waves. So I've got a few fish before and um, it's going to sit and wait and then the next school will come through. So that school's moved down the paddock a bit further. Bed or whatever they do will look the leader of the pack says, let's get out of here. Old Jimmy's gone missing. And uh, so, there you go. And then we we'll wait for the next lot to come through. Yeah, when you listen to it on YouTube, it's, it's not out yet, but when it does come out, um, you better hear it all better. Another school comes through now, it's about probably five minutes later. You can see my pliers here, so we're straightening the hooks up a little. So, worm, straight on again, and straight back out again. Well, uh, the wind doesn't seem to worry about too much, guys. If it's windy, don't worry about it. Um, if it's raining, yeah, they don't like rain too much. I've caught while in rain, but nothing <coughs> like when it's not raining. For those of us not landmates, mm. I definitely go to the beach, mate. Yeah. Um, I try around the pump and jetty, like I talked about. <coughs> um, definitely my go to. Um, or I'd maybe um, go down Labrador on the low tide, which is um, at the moment, yeah. and fish that first and right tide. So yeah. Right it, that, uh, yeah, but you're on, um, if you're land based, yeah. um, I'd be going just yeah, where, where the lights are, Labrador, just walk straight over the front there, yeah. um, with a the tuna. Metal things up, mm -hmm. and just walk over there. And you'll see the ripples. You'll see the shallow part. You'll see the edge. Try and get that low tide. Then look, feel that water turning about. Where it starts to get cooler, yeah. and then yeah. cast from there. It doesn't have to be a drop off. You know, be still that deep. So as long as that water temperature change. So let's put the lip again. That's how quick it is. To get the hook out. You haven't missed a fish yet, but we're throwing it in the back. No, just done that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, the bigger whiting, really fun, I like here, they, um, Pull it through me hard. That's a good one. So I think that day, the, which is only the last week, I think the biggest I got was um, 38 or something. 
I lost a couple of good ones too. I've got my thirty eight of them. So the other rod's going, so I'm sorry. I'm using on those rods I'm using I use mono my LVs. And those ones I've got braid on, but um, I use mono on oh, we've got a couple of um yeah, mono ones yeah. too. Yeah. Uh, but that does really like so I don't normally have a bit of both. Yeah. 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 They're so good to eat, aren't they? Such a good fish. Shanko or something. Can you just... Oh, it depends on the size. <laughs> <laughs> on that size, about four. <laughs> on the small one, about ten. <laughs> yeah. So they're good for one in fact. Yeah. So, I just I want to show you how to... Pulled a few out because my wife had not put them on, it's not too good. <laughs> but anyhow, that's, that's the sort of thing, guys. Um, but that's uh, when you land based on the shore, mate, with get back to the gentleman fall. Um, the only two times I ever uh, use my rod hot in my hand is then, because they're aggressive feeding like they are on the beach. It's a different to just cast out the shoreline and watching the rod sort of thing. It's a different type of feeding. So if they're working with the current coming up, whatever, whatever. And I get the turn off. Oh, you turn the light back on, mate. Yeah, cheers, mate. And um, so, um, learn if you shore based land, learn to run your rod out of the. Um, thanks, Jack. Out of the um, out of your rod hold or whatever. <coughs> it works. It's better. And um, but hold it in, on the shore line when you're doing that depth, depth of water thing. So then, yeah, you, you don't go over about sort of below your knees. That's about as deep as you ever go. So. So but sometimes you might be 20 or 30 metres from the shoreline. Okay. It's just shallow all the way there. Yeah. Don't we catch a lot of fish though, Jack, don't we? Yeah. Smash it. Good morning, yeah. Yeah, but you've got to have a wading bag or something like that for fishing, but it's just easier. And have a little tackle box there, because they swallow it down and retie hook on. So what I do, guys, I make up my rigs. I make up my swivel and hook, and I just get some pool noodle or a little um, rubber thing like that and just wrap sort of eight, six or eight rigs around it. And my little pocket of um, assorted sinkers, and that's it. That's all. And a pair of scissors, so, uh, and a pair of pliers. That's that's my kit. And then I've got my worms in here, or my yabbies, whatever. And um, you, you can put me twenty whiting in my bag if I go back to the shoreline. And you don't lose your spot as well. If there's other people fishing the area, <laughs> people see you catching fish, they want to come straight in, <laughs> get your spot. Yeah. Uh, these rod bells, you all know how they work, they clip on your rod quite easily. Um, so, has anyone not used that? Has anyone used this type of thing before? Have, they, have they anyone used it? I know the pain they are, so when you have the boat fishing and you hear ding 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 ding, you know the guy behind you using rod bells, of course. Um, but he's probably catching fish because he's, he's not missing any bites. Amazing how things tangle up and, and they just fall over. Like you have to grab the that. So you gotta have a little um a little thing at the bottom that you can unscrew out. It's also a little um, application for a silent stick as well. So it just clips on your rod. So when you clip it on, do not clip your line onto the clip part, okay? And hang it up to the top. You don't want to get caught on your thing when you're turning around. When you can't see it outside. It's a little um thing on the top of your Just cut it up twice, like that. Like that. So that's it's under. The little silo stick clips in there for the little bottom. But well, that's it. And sit that in. It shouldn't turn around that way. It's always one of these. Maybe you should bring it back on. <laughs> um, but that's how it sits. Like yeah, and it's in a fish bite. It's quite, quite easy to do. <clears throat> when you 
Je suis sûr que je vais vous faire ça quand je vais. Je vais bien aller. Je vais vous faire des effets dans le monde. Je vais vous faire ça. Je vais vous faire ça. Any questions on Wally Fishing or Ghost? Yes, my friend. Moonface. Moonface, yeah, good call. Um, I don't like full moon at night time. Um, I like uh, those tides. Um, they do coincide with one full moon, but um, yeah, that's the fish that rang I'm talking about. Um, daytime, uh, I like definitely run in tide up the rivers. I'm fishing rivers at daytime. I don't like running out tide. But night time, I only like running out tide. High tide run out. That's the only option. Moon phase is probably not as important as the tide, so they're different. Some fish are very moon deciding, um, but not, not biting. They're very um, timid though on lows, so um, I actually went out yesterday morning up to the, um, what's this, the Paradise, this boat around Paradise Point on the bank, on the bank there, <coughs> this is Paradise Point Harbour, Boat Harbour. Um, there's a couple of guys fishing there too. It was horror, it was blowing about 25 knots southerly, east southerly. It was raining and it was a thousand eight hexapascals. <laughs> um, the the um, whatever was very like a low system feeling and they just didn't bite. I got took that out again. I think it was about eight or ten. Good size one. But they just didn't they weren't for me that's not biting, so <laughs> they weren't biting. Um, but um, they were um, they're still there, they're, they're everywhere in the rivers at the moment. Yeah. So um, but Try and get it when it's sunny, they love sunny, especially when it's walking that water, mate. They really love clear water and sunshine. And, uh, and, and early morning, mate. Early morning? Yeah. And tides for the beach? Uh, just with a lot of the tide running up. Right, yeah. It doesn't have to be big tides, small tides. As long as you get that low tide about 6 in the morning, which is this weekend. Yeah. Which is now. Yeah. yeah. 6 or 7. Or even 8, the court can go there at 9 o'clock in the morning. Really? 10 o'clock, and <coughs> as long as it kind of sides with the tide, which was. Nine on Sunday, so you go at nine, ten o'clock, and we catch them. Yeah. Okay. Um, what else is happening? That's about it, I think, on that. Here goes sand crab. Plenty okay, sand crabs around the moment, guys. Yep. Got a few last weekend. Just haven't been for a few weeks. The last one had a little and a lot of females, and thought I'd give it a shot. And got um, uh, I think about sixteen crabs over a couple of nights. The second day, my four of my pots were checked. Out of six pots, you get that. The other two crab, two pots had uh, five crabs in two pots, but four pots were not were put in the line. They were right over there or right over there. They don't move by themselves. The other two were perfect. <laughs> Anyhow, um, but plenty of crabs around. Mm. Big sand, it's really big sand. It's that sand crabs. Okay. My mates are getting some good muddies at the moment too. Um, that's probably about it to tell you about. Um, just a couple of things, right? Um, how many people here wash their boat with that like Soltex type stuff and stuff like that? It's really good stuff. Um, this is even better. Okay, <laughs> just tell me about it. It's called Desaltinator Boat Wash. Um, my brother Paul's involved with this. But I'll just tell you about it. Yeah. <laughs> so um, you can look at the QR code here. We're going to be having some stops, so you just scan it if you want to have a look. Amazing technology today. Um, but you see how it works. But one capful in um, in the normal wash thing, it does. You can buy these jet head things here like that. Um, that you put, I think, two capfuls in, um, and you just spray it on the boat like a foam top stuff, and then you just hose it off. That's it. There's no hand washing at all. And then this one here, um, it's like Rain-X type material, so it's called Screen Shield. Spray it on any of your glass, on your sound of screens, or anything that's to do with that. Even you can actually put it on, on the fiberglass, on the tinnies. I think boat wraps are right. And um, it um, leaves a, like a beading type system on it, so it gets all the salt just disappears, and you hose it off, and um, and then it leaves this film in there. And then the more you put it on, it each time you go out, it builds a like a like a glaze on it, I guess, and the water just falls straight off like the water of a duck's back. Okay. Pretty good. Sunglasses too, by the way. Uh, so. Mm. Wax on. Uh, so it's not going to give away one of these. They do, they're up there. I think this one retails. So like wax. Like wax, yeah, like wax, yeah. I think that one's retails about $39, but you get around about 
60 bit washer there or something, so it's not too bad. I think that one's about 29 or something. There's a follow-up on Facebook continually about salt and cap. Mm, salt and cap, same sort of stuff, but yeah. this, is, this is actually supposed to be better. Yeah. Um, the biochemist did this, and he's, it's a um, yeah, different material, different something a bit better, yeah. Where's that um, smell about? Uh, we've got it coming, <coughs> uh, we've got it in stock now, we haven't got the labels on it, but on the weekend we'll be out, yeah. Yeah. What brand is that? <coughs> uh, it's, it's called desal desalinator. Desalinator, sorry, not desalinator. Desalinator uh, and screen chill. The company, I think it's desalinator. Um, you can scan the scan the QR codes, but it gives us way to You can scan the QR codes and have a look. Okay, guys. So. <laughs> You could definitely hold a stubby and just hose it back off while you're doing it. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's what's the important part. It actually even says on there, I think it says, can still hold stubby while washing. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so tonight we've got a couple of outfits to work. Very similar to these, okay guys? So, we've got a very light one for the boat and off the shore. And we've got one from the beach. So actually off the shore. This is actually like this is actually the newer version of my old one. Um, that one there is about two hundred. Oh, actually, it's about three hundred bucks of stuff in it. A bit over, and that one's a bit over two hundred bucks. Okay, um, put everything in it. We're going to draw this right now. So, guys, um, just let you know, our next seminar, um, which will be in two weeks' time, early November. Um, John doesn't know yet. Hello, John. Uh, we're getting Johnny the Jack guy to hopefully come along and do Mango Jacks. Um, talking about it's all lure fishing now, okay? But we might throw in a bit of bait, live bait fishing with him on the night. Depends how busy it is. <coughs> and then the one and two weeks after that's on uh, catching um, dolphin fish. Okay. okay, so tonight, for the first prize, do you want to draw Jack? Oh, yeah. Uh, is. Jack's got the names there. Jack, it's number 18. Yo, Dave. Dave. <laughs> Yo. There you go. Okay. My cousin, Dave. You're good best to be later, isn't it? <laughs> good on, Dave. He's all the numbers 18 in there, right? Good on, Dave. Well done, buddy. Okay. Okay, next one, Jack, of the book there, mate. Mm. Number 18. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's number nine. <laughs> well, I'm your CEO. Good job, mate. Congratulations, buddy. I'll shake your hand, mate. <laughs> good it's a really good ride, mate. Enjoy it. Thank you. That's the other Okay. That's all <laughs> yeah, so uh, we've got the quarter pass. So 13 um, is about, I think, 100 and, I don't know, 150 bucks, much, for third place, and it goes to Jack at the bottom. Number seven. Number seven. Well done, mate. Congratulations. Excellent. Good on you. Thank you, sir. How much? Keep that over here. Oops, seven. Um, okay, fourth prize. I think it's still around 100 bucks. Yeah. Um, I'll swap it. That's when you hold it for a second. <laughs> <laughs> Number four. It's Alex. Number four, Alex. That's you, Alex. Well done, buddy. Welcome back, Alex. Welcome back. Thanks, mate. Thank you. Um, Next one, I think is around that's 26. Five, I think it's still around about 50 bucks or something, or 50, 70 bucks. On this one. I thought it was 18, it was 17. Good on you, matey. Thank you, sir. Good luck on the whiting at there, too, mate. Thank you. And the last one, which is still around 40, 50 bucks, number six goes to 
So it's all the stuff I use, stuff that's like that tonight, guys, okay? Whiting are very simple. It's a simple fish. You just got to do it right. That's the number six. Um, Chris, again. Chris, well done, Chris. Hey, buddy. Cheers, mate. Yes. Thank you. Good on you, mate. Thank you. I'll put, like, put them all back in again. I'm going to draw these two. Okay. Aileen comes out. I won't be getting called. <laughs> <laughs> for the bigger bottle. So thanks, uh, Paul and Adrian. I guess Adrian. Number one. Dave. Dave, well on you, Dave. You got a boat, Dave? Yeah. Good on you, matey. Enjoy. Let me know how it goes, okay? And <coughs> for the screen one. So we'll have this in stock, guys. Um, just let you know, too, um, they do do a range of clothes. I don't want clothes inside. It's part of the deal. I have to wear clothes and give away that. So, um, which we will be stocking for Christy, but it's not here yet. Um, geez, around that 18, let me tell you again. Six day. Good on you, matey. Yeah. Thanks, Brendan. All yours, mate. You got a boat too, mate? Probably more, yes. Okay, good on you, mate. Thanks. All right, so you can put it on your Sundays in here, mate. Yeah. <laughs> so, everyone, thanks so much for coming along. Um, anything you need in this sort of category, rods, whatever, we've got 37 set for reels, best price online. And um, you got enough gear in there to get yourselves going and doing it right, okay? Good luck out there. Thank you. Thanks, Jack. Thanks, guys. Thank you. And we're open for half an hour if you want to buy anything up to you guys. Thanks a lot. These are pretty good. No, I haven't looked at that before it came up. Yeah, yeah, they are, mate. Yeah, they're good thing blows. Yeah. The Japanese steel. Yeah. I enjoyed that. Thanks very much. Good luck to you, mate. Are you welcome, Alice? Thank you, mate. Hey, you're welcome, Alice. 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 Thank you, mate. Hey, you're welcome, Oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah, 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 <la